Good evening, everybody. I'm going to be brief because I know you want to hear Victoria, not me. So um, I'll just say that uh, I'm very happy that she's come to speak to us tonight. And uh, she's coming, I believe, from Boston, if I'm not mistaken. I was at Boston. You were at Boston. Okay. Yeah, I'm coming, but this is, I'm coming from Vanderbilt. Okay, so she is uh, permanently a professor at Vanderbilt University, uh, associate professor of philosophy, and has recently been at the Center for Post-Kantian Philosophy at the University of Potsdam, and uh, is of course known to some of us because of her 2020 book, Hegel's Concept of Life, and a number of other very interesting articles that she's published on that and related topics. And um, I will just say that she's to speak to us tonight, it's on screen yet, on Fanon and Hegel on the recognition of humanity. So I invite you to come on. So can everyone hear me? Um, thanks so much for that introduction, Omar. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you so much, Carol, for inviting me here. I'm going to try to share my screen. So <laughs> this talk that I'm giving today um, is part of um, um, a special issue on um, that's going to come out in the Hegel Bulletin, um, edited by Daniel James and friends Knopic, um, trying to explore Hegel on questions of racism and colonialism. Um, and uh, the paper that I'm contributing, and it's still work in progress. In fact, I have to finalize it later next week. So I'm really looking forward to your comments and you can help me uh, wrap it up and send it off to them, um, is uh, trying to explore uh, whether we can identify or pull out something like a concept of a, a theory or concept of recognition in Fanon. Um, Fanon's thinking on this topic is clearly influenced by Hegel. Um, and one of the ways in which I think Fanon sort of not in a very novel way innovates or develops um, a broadly Hegelian theory of recognition, if we want to call it that, is by focusing on this concept of humanity. Um, that in a lot of the passages from Black Skin, White Masks that I'll talk about um, throughout the talk, that one of the ways that he develops Hegel's theory of recognition, if you want to put it that way, is by making the concept of the human front and center. And I want to try to work out, so how does recognition work for Fanon? What is the concept of the human that's at work there? Um, so... Um, I'll get started. Sorry, I'm having trouble with this Zoom. <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. That works. Okay. So the background, um, or you could say the sort of, uh, the, the passage from Fanon that is sort of at the forefront as I think about these topics and that will be one of the things that this talk is going to try to figure out is basically to give an interpretation or have an understanding of this passage. This comes near the end of Black Skin, White Masks, and this is sort of the framing of, of the talk in terms of thinking about Fanon on the concept of recognition, and he says near the very end of Black Skin, White Masks, I find myself suddenly in the world, uh, and I recognize for myself one right alone, that of demanding human behavior from the other. Um, and I think sort of there's a lot baked into this quote. So immediately I just wanna break down a few things um, to try to think about why the quote is so significant for thinking about what Fanon might understand by recognition. So first is this existentialist point of departure, right? He says, I find myself suddenly in the world. Um, Clearly he's alluding to this existentialist conception of a situation where I find myself in a situation that I did not choose, that I did not make, um, but it is a situation that I sort of have to take up as part of my um, constituting myself as a free agent. Um, the condition of childhood is always the sort of paradigmatic example used by the existentialist. So it, in, in, for example, in the ethics of ambiguity for Simone de Beauvoir. So he's starting, I find myself suddenly in the world and this is an existentialist point of departure. He's saying that within the situation um, that he, he finds himself suddenly in the world, he has one single right. Um, and he says that he recognizes this right immediately. The right that he recognizes is a demand directed toward the other. So it's immediately second personal. So it's a second personal demand that he immediately recognizes in being thrown into the situation. 
Um, and he recognizes this right for himself and recognizes himself in this right. <laughs> so um, I think this is, uh, given that, given the, the concept of recognition as sort of the way that I'm thinking about it as stemming from this German idealist tradition, I think Fanon here is giving a really interesting spin on the way in which recognition and second personal relations can be, can serve as a kind of underlying condition of self-consciousness. And here he's saying that he recognizes in his, himself in recognizing this demand. The last piece of the quote is probably the most mysterious. He says that, um, I, what, what is this demand? It's the demand for human behavior from the other. The idea of human behavior, I think, is very difficult. We're going to try to, I'll try to think about what that might mean. Um, I think very likely, um, it certainly, it would, given the intellectual context um, that he's working in, he's drawing on this idea of human behavior in Merleau-Ponty. Um, we know that but on red, um, Merleau-Ponty's structure of behavior very carefully. That's an interesting historical context, but I don't think it really helps us explain exactly what he might mean by that. I do think in Fanon's work, clearly we get lots of instant in his account of um, racism and colonialism. Clearly he gives us lots of examples of what inhuman or dehumanizing behavior might be. But minimally, we could say that a demand for human behavior from the other um, is going to be a recognition of and a respect for existential freedom. Um, uh, where we are, um, the demand is that we create or sustain conditions under which existential freedom can be meaningfully exercised, um, creating what he calls, and this is a sort of technical term for Fanon, um, he uses the term human reality many, many times throughout uh, Black Skin, White Masks and in other places, and I want to think of this as a kind of technical term, um, the idea of a human reality that ultimately for him is going to be constituted through relations of recognition. So what I want to suggest, what I'm going to try to argue today is, is to sort of take this quote that I started with and use this claim as a basis for a distinctive theory of recognition that we can get from his work. He's clearly developing Hegel's work in a novel direction. Um, one of the things that I want to try to understand is the, um, the, the concept of humanity that's at work in developing his theory of recognition. Um, I want to argue, I'm going to argue in the second section, that the way to understand Fanon's humanism or his invocation of the idea of humanity in the relation of recognition is to think about humanity in uh, concretely universal terms. Um, and before I came here, Carol very helpfully sent me a paper of hers where she wrote about the concrete universal in connection with um, feminist questions and questions, uh, the, the, the woman question, right? The extent to which we can talk about universality in feminist context. And I think there's an, uh, I, I wish I had read that paper sooner, but I'm really glad that you sent it to me because now I can include it in the final version. But um, essentially I wanna argue that how do we understand Fanon's invocation of the human in his work and the idea of concrete universality is, I think, the right way of thinking about um, his use of the idea of universal humanity within the context of a theory of recognition. Um, and his, in, in, in works in, in The Wretched of the Earth, where he talks about this idea of new humanity, I think the idea of a concrete universal will also hopefully help us understand um, how we might interpret that idea as well. So my plan for today, I'm going to try to, uh, the paper's too long, of course, so I'm going to try to move through some things pretty quickly. I'm going to, you know, skip some things, but roughly the plan is in the first section, what I'm going to do, what I want do in the paper and what I'll do here in, in a very cursory way is basically give a close reading um, of that section on Hegel from Black Skin, White Masks. Fanon um, selects three very important and specific passages from the pheno Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And from that, I'm going to, his reading of those passages, I'm going to try to pull out something like the general theory of recognition that we get um, from his reading of Hegel and the role that the concept of humanity plays there. In the second section, um, I'm going to distinguish between what I think are three different senses of how we might talk about an idea of universal humanity. Um, one sense is going to be false or ideological, another sense is going to be abstract, and then the third sense is going to be concrete. I'm gonna draw a bit more on Hegel to sort of unpack that idea of concrete universality and how that might help us with understanding um, Fanon's invocation of the human. And then in the last section, I'm gonna to return to the quote that I just unpacked 
Um, the longer version of the quote, Fanon says that we have one human right, and he frames that in terms of recognition. And then he says we have one human duty, which he frames in terms of a concept of existential freedom. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to combine the concrete universality stuff <laughs> with some thing, some ideas that we get from existential humanism and Sartre's in particular, because I think it's important that in argue in defending a notion of the concrete universal, we need to retain some of the anti-essentialist existentialist claims um, that Fanon is clearly committed to. So that's what I will try to do in the last section. Um, so the first first section, um, I'm gonna. The, the, one of the complications, which we can talk about in the Q&A, but I'm not going to talk about here for, for the sake of time, is that just getting into that text section of the text is very difficult. Um, most of the literature is about whether or not it's even appropriate to say that, um, Heg uh, sorry, that Fanon um, is uh, appropriating or developing Hegelian themes rather than just simply rejecting Hegel um, on account of a very famous footnote from that section. Um, that's one complication. Um, well, I'm, I won't put that totally aside. I'll say something about that in a minute. There's another complication that um, Fanon's Hegel is obviously a French Hegel. It's as much the Hegel that you get from Kojev. It's it's Beauvoir. It's, so there's a lot of complicated interpretive issues in approaching these sec th this section from Black Skin, White Masks and the passages from Hegel that he selects. Um, the first thing I'll say, so I'll go through the three passages and then pull out what I think are three essential features of Fanon's theory of recognition. But um, the first thing I'll say to take note of, so much of the literature is about the master-slave dialectic, but the three passages quoted by Fanon are not, at, all of them are from the general theory of recognition that we get in the beginning of the section of the phenomenology on self-consciousness and not about the master-slave dialectic at all. So in some ways, the emphasis in the literature on the master-slave dialectic is a little bit, I would argue, askew. <laughs> because the the reading that he's giving of Hegel there is much more, I think, focused on the general account of recognition rather than on the master-slave dialectic per se. So um, the first passage um, is the epigraph of this section. Um, and it is, Fanon sort of discusses this as a way of trying to account for how we might understand something about humanity and its value. Um, this is a very famous quote. I don't. I don't know how much of the audience knows of Hegel. And it's, I. Um, I assume you probably know a lot. But um, this is um, um, a quote from Chapter Four of the Phenomenology of Spirit, where Hegel says, "Self consciousness exists in and for itself, when and by the fact that it so exists for another that it exists only in being acknowledged or recognized." This is a very famous passage. It essentially, if you take it sort of within the context of German philosophy. Um, it establishes what we now call um, in, in contemporary sec second personal relations. Relations of recognition are basically conditions of possibility for um, individual self-consciousness. Um, it's a sort of deeply intersubjective account of what it is to be a self or to be an I. Um, and this coming from, obviously this quote is from Hegel, it also comes from Fichte, but I think this is a very interesting place for Fanon to start. Um, because what he essentially does is that he takes this um, idea of recognition being a condition for self-consciousness and translates this Hegelian idea into what we might call humanist terms. So one thing that he says is that one, he doesn't say that we are self-conscious or an individual on account of recognition from the other, but he says that we are human on account of recognition from the other. Um, one, um, just quoting him again, he says that human worth and reality depend upon recognition from the other. So uh, this is just a sort of very um, initial first step, again, translating this Hegelian idea of recognition into humanist terms. Um, when he talks about human real the reality of being human, one important thing to note is that he's not talking about mere existence. He's talking about reality with a distinctive kind of value um, that is constituted and created through relations of recognition. And very importantly, in this tradition, but I think also for Fanon, um, what's at stake in recognition is not 
the cognitive identification of somebody as a human being. So it's not about, we're not, what, what he's, when he says that recognition is a condition of possibility for being human, he's not saying that we need to be categorized or cognitively identified as human. What he's saying is that we need forms of practical treatment, of engagement and action. Um, so concrete, practical forms of engagement. Um, and that that's the kind of recognition um, that is necessary for the condition of possibility of being human. And this is something that is emphasized both in the German philosophical tradition, but also in the contemporary literature on recognition. It's very much not about just categorizing or identifying someone as a human being. So the second um, passage that Fanon quotes has to do with the reciprocity of recognition. I think one of the things I wanna argue, again, in the paper, I get more into the, de the debates in the literature, I think in the literature, it's sort of accepted that Fanon thinks that there is no, in, in, the, in a racist and colonial context, right, in the Manichaean world of black and white, there is no reciprocity. And so that's why Hegel isn't even helpful for thinking about the concept of, uh, for Hegel on recognition is not helpful for thinking about questions of, of anti-racism or decolonization. Um, and I want to argue against that view. I actually think that Fanon accepts the reciprocity condition of recognition. So the quote from Hegel, um, the action of one side would be useless because what is to happen can only be brought about by both. They recognize themselves as mutually recognizing one another. Um, and thinking about reciprocity, one way to help us disambiguate what we might mean by reciprocity here, we can think about reciprocity in two senses, and that allows us to account for both the necess ne necessity of reciprocity in the relation of recognition, but also account for the fact that obviously in many cases, including in Hegel's master-slave dialectic, obviously in the colonial situation, um, obviously in the Manichaean world that Fanon describes, that there is no mutual recognition. So I want to distinguish between thinking about reciprocity as a structural feature of recognition, and I think that is something that both Hegel and Fanon subscribe to. Um, recognition by definition as a second personal relation, it has to be something that happens on, it's a two-sided, right? The structure of it is a double action, as Hegel says. Each recognizes the other and recognizes that the other is engaged in the same act. Um, this is also, we, we get, um, Sartre has an account of this. So it's very clear that I think the structural feature of reciprocity has to be um, something that Fanon subscribes to in his understanding of recognition. There is a more demanding sense of reciprocity that I think we need to clearly acknowledge when Fanon expresses his um, suspicion of uh, um, notions of reciprocal recognition, which is we could say that there's a normative sense of re reciprocity or mutual recognition where the relation is symmetrical, equal, neither subjugates one another, neither treats the other um, uh, neither demeans one another, but instead we treat the other in a way that promotes their aims through their actions. Um, clearly, when we're thinking about the normative sense of mutual recognition, the paradigmatic case of failure is going to be a master-slave relationship. In Fanon, it is the colonial situation, right? That's the, the, the key, um, the paradigm case of miss or non-recognition. And then in Hegel, we get these paradigm cases of um, mutual recognition um, as in, and maybe he's idealizing, we can, whether we, that's a, that's an interpretive question, whether or not he's idealizing these um, as examples, as in love and friendship. Those would be instances of mutual recognition. And so I wanted to separate out these two issues. And what I, and, and once we separate out these two issues, I think we see that Fanon does affirm the importance of reciprocity um, and that he, in that this famous footnote, this is the stuff in the literature, I'm not gonna get too deep into this. The famous footnote that's often referred to as a reason for saying that no, Fanon rejects Hegel, um, I think is actually um, a, a, a reflection of something else, right? Um, what this, it, the importance of the footnote, I think is not about reciprocity per se, because I actually think that Fanon does not reject Hegel's general account of recognition as constitutive of the self, nor this requirement of reciprocity um, as both a potential, as both a structural and potentially normative feature of genuinely human forms of recognition. But what this passage 
is about is he's right reflecting on the context of the abolition of slavery in France. But what it also brings us to is I think the next feature of his theory of recognition, which is about the significance of struggle and conflict um, in establishing relations of normative reciprocity. Um, that when we actually do establish relations of mutual, right, genuinely, normatively robust forms of mutual recognition, that this is something that arises through struggle. So we see this in the third and final passage um, that he quotes in this section. Um, it's a very famous passage. Um, it's a passage that um, contemporary uh, Hegelians also make a, a, a lot of in understanding Hegel's theory of freedom. So it's the passage where Hegel says that it is only through staking one's life that freedom is won. It is thus only thus is it proved that for self-consciousness, it, its essential being is not just being, et cetera, et cetera. The individual who has not risked his life may well be recognized as a person, but he has not attained the truth of this recognition as an independent self-consciousness. So Fanon, so the claim here is that struggle, possibly even the risk of life, is essential for recognition and freedom. Fanon clearly cites this passage affirmatively um, in, in, in the text. And one question that we should, I think, ask ourselves um, is that it is to think about what exactly he takes to be essential for establishing the human world of res reciprocal recognition, as he calls it, without romanticizing or ontologizing conflict for its own sake. I think that's the, the sort of tightrope that we have to walk in reading how Fanon is treating this, because I don't, um, and I think it's it's an issue for interpreting Hegel as well, but in, in the case of Fanon, I think I would want to avoid, even though he cites this passage affirmatively, I want to avoid the thought that there's something um, ontologic that conflict is somehow ontologically necessary in the struggle for freedom. So I actually think Fanon clarifies this in the text. So um, I will read this passage, although the last line is cut off for me. Let me see if I can move this so I can see it. Um, okay, so thus, this is um, Fanon. He writes, thus human reality in and for itself can be achieved only through struggle and through the risk that struggle implies. This means that I go beyond life toward a supreme good that is the transformation of subjective certainty of my own worth into a universally valid objective truth. As soon as I desire, I'm asking to be considered. I demand that notice be taken of my negating activity insofar as I pursue something other than life, insofar as I struggle for the creation of a human world that is a world of reciprocal recognition. I think that's the, can, can you guys see that on? Okay, um, so what what is, how, how does Fanon try to clarify his 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 um, affirmative reading of of uh, Hegel's claim that we need that risk that that freedom basically involves risk and maybe maybe violent struggle? Um, so for one thing, he clarifies here really nicely that. Struggle is, you could say, it, it's a necessary, as soon as, as soon as we have desire, uh, as soon as there's, and, and of course Hegel begins the whole story by saying that self-consciousness is desire. So as soon as desire is on the scene, you could say that the idea of struggle is there because we're struggle, we're struggling to satisfy desires and, op, and right, any number of obstacles could be put in my way. I could even get in my own way. Um, but I think what he, it, the, the key, I think, to reading this, this passage is that for Fanon, what he's saying is that under oppressive conditions or under inhuman conditions, the risk of struggling for freedom is clearly heightened, right? Um, the extreme case is, of course, risk of death. Um, but I think, and there are some passages in the essay on violence where he says that the key there, it's, it's the... The, I don't want to bring to the table the question of the justification of violence because that's not the topic of my talk and a very separate, complicated issue for Fanon. But I think what's more important for Fanon rather rather than thinking about the role of violence is about this idea of, he, he calls it irreversible acts. Um, and so we can think about the his affirmative uh, citation of Hegel in this context, not as romanticizing or essentializing or ontologizing the need for conflict um, or violence um, or struggle, but to emphasize that under oppressive in, uh, inhuman conditions, freedom requires risk. Uh, freedom or free freedom entails risk and requires struggle 
in order to um, attain the relations of mutual recognition that he's striving for. So very quickly, just summing up here, these three, I think we get three uh, claims um, uh, in connection with thinking about the importance of the human in Fanon's theory of recognition. First, recognition is constitutive of the self. Um, so this is something that Fanon takes on board from Hegel, um, translating into humanist terms, claiming that human worth, reality, and value are dependent upon relations of recognition. Um, second, reciprocity is both a structural and normative feature of recognition. Um, and where recognition is one-sided or unequal, um, his, his claim is that our goal is to create a human world of reciprocal recognition. Um, and then the third claim is that establishing relations of reciprocal recognition involves risk and struggle. Under oppressive and human conditions, risk of life and violence are likely involved in actions that aim at affirming the value of human existence and the creation of human reality. Um, and we can sort of affirm that without romanticizing or ontologizing um, the question of, of conflict and violence. Okay, so what I wanna do in the next section um, Fanon, in presenting the, the account of recognition, clearly says that what, what we want is human, right? Why, why does he keep invoking not just recognition, but recognition um, that we need human recognition? What is the significance of this idea of humanity in his work? And I want to disambiguate between three senses of how we might think about um, universal humanity. The first sense is a, what I'm calling a false sense. The second sense is abstract. And the third sense is the concrete, which is the one that I think we is the most helpful for understanding how we might understand um, his invocation of the human. So the first is uh, the, the false sense of um, universal humanity is maybe the most obvious one that uh, he clearly wants to reject. And many, not, Fanon is not alone in wanting to reject this notion of universal humanity. Um, he said that so this is, um, uh, Fanon says this, this Europe, which never stopped talking of man, which never stopped proclaiming its sole concern was man. We now know the price suffering humanity has paid for every one of its spiritual victories. That's a great quote because he, he's clearly using humanity. Like he says, he begins by saying man sort of in this right negative false universal sense. And even in the same sense, in the same breath, he also invokes this idea of suffering humanity, which he clearly wants to mean in a very different sense. Um, in Satra's preface to The Wretched of the Earth, he also sort of refers to the, the, uni the, the ideological sense of universal humanity um, that we're, again, all familiar with. And I just want to put that this one in some ways we I'm putting on the table to very quickly reject and to acknowledge that Fanon is aware that there are false and ideological ways of employing the notion of humanity. It's a false universal because basically it takes what is actually in fact deeply particular characteristics, features, whether it's rationality, whiteness, um, um, male, right, all the things that we might identify tr that are traditionally identified with the human, those are actually very particular characteristics that are presented as universal. And then it's also false in the second sense because then it serves as an ideological cover for forms of domination and injustice. Um, so I'm not, I won't read the Sartre quote. Um, what we also see though, I think in, in Fanon's analysis, um, especially uh, in, in black skin, the, both of these quotes are from black skin, white masks, is that Fanon also acknowledges that we appeal to humanity in a, in a second sense. So there's the ideological sense, but we also appeal to humanity in the sense that I want to call an, an, in the sense of an abstract universal. So Fanon contrasts his phenomenological and psychological approach um, in Black Skin, White Masks with the more obvious path of, he said, uh, of, quote, calling on humanity, on the belief in dignity, on love, on charity, to prove or to win the admission that the Black is the equal of the white. And then later on in the text, he says something alluding to this, what I'm calling an abstract sense of humanity that he wants to reject. He says, I do not carry innocence to the point of believing that appeals to reason or respect for human dignity can alter reality. So again, this is puzzling because we, I think we need to, these are helpful contrasts, right? These are, he's clearly aware of ways of appealing to the human that are not effective. Um, and I want to, what I'm calling the abstract universality charge here um, is Hegelian in spirit, I think. Um, 
of course, that leads to the question, well, what makes these universals that he's appealing to abstract as opposed to concrete? Um, and answering this question will uh, hopefully lead us to this idea of the concrete universal. So very, very quickly, um, getting into a little bit more of the Hegel here, the Hegelian background here. Um, Hegel's aim in distinguishing between what he calls an abstract universal and a concrete universal is basically to try to come to the right understanding of the relationship between the categories of universality, particularity, and individuality. And we can think of these categories, right? Universality is obviously about the general. Um, particularity is about tokens of a type, um, what, they, what uh, tokens of a type might share in common insofar as they are members of the same kind. And individuality can hear sometimes in the text, it's also translated as singularity is about uniqueness. Um, those features of unique individuals that are not reducible to them being tokens of a type or to the general kind to which they belong. Um, again, very, very at a very high level altitude, Hegel just wants to say, these three things, we always need to think of these three things as deeply interconnected, right? No, no surprise. That's a, Hegel always wants to think of everything as interconnected. Um, but basically what he says is that determining the truth or the concept of any particular subject matter requires that we understand the interconnections between these three moments of universal, particular, and individual. And essentially the charge of abstract universality is a charge that we're grasping a universal as separate and independent from the individuals that exemplify them. And I think that when Fanon says that these empty appeals to right, universal human dignity or that you know, all humans should be treated as equal, um, I don't think he's, he's not rejecting them outright, but what he's, when he says that they're ineffective, I think the charge is in part uh, a worry about the, 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 that they're abstract as opposed to concrete universals. So just to take his examples, the examples that he used, um, when we say that, um, let's just take dignity, um, dignity is a pro is a universal or is a, a property of human beings. We're basically treating it, and this is how Hegel understands it, that we're treating dignity here as a property universal. And what do I mean by that? Um, the idea of dignity can clearly be understood independently of the individual humans, human beings of which it is a property. Um, how, how do we know that? Well, dignity is a property of many different kinds of things, including right things that are not human beings. Um, we, horses might have dignity, professions have dignity, maybe traditions have dignity. Um, human beings obviously also have many other properties and that we get into this question of which properties are essential or accidental. Um, and Carol, I know you also talk about this in your account of the concrete universal, um, the problem of identifying essential properties or characteristics. Um, and I think in, in your account too, it's also Hegelian in spirit. Um, this brings us to, so we can say one further thing, right? Hegel says, okay, obviously when we identify these properties, we're trying to ident identify an essential property. <laughs> um, and what we're really trying to say, he says, is that all human beings are equal in dignity. And so dignity is an essential property of all human beings. Um, but Hegel says that the all here, clearly all is a quantitative, it's, it's quantifier, it's a quantitative determination. He uses the term that this is an empirical universal. And what this means is that universal in the sense of allness is then always provisional, right? He says that we, in, we, we actually need to count and check to see if every single human being actually instantiates this property. And so he says that we're not, we're, in that case, in understanding universality in this way, we're still not identifying something about the necessary or intrinsic connection between human beings and their supposed, um, uh, dig that should say dignity, but it's covered up. <laughs> um, so in moving towards this idea of the concrete universal, um, one thing, this is a sort of trend, a, a transitional claim that's going to help me get to how can I, how because Fanon himself doesn't talk about the concrete universal. I think this is one interpretive problem with what I'm trying to say here in bringing in the idea of the concrete universal to how he understands the human. Um, I do think it is the right way, but he, he doesn't actually refer to the idea of the concrete universal. One sort of mediating step that makes it such that my argument is at least plausible is that although Fanon did not refer to the idea of the concrete universal directly, um, his teacher, um, M. S. Césaire, did. Um, and in fact, M. S. Césaire was very, in, 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 and I'm going to read these passages in a minute, um, in, in his understanding, you, you, 
in some ways, I think this paper is not about Césaire, but I think Césaire's way of understanding the role of thinking about the human in the context of decolonial um, decolonial praxis, he also invokes the idea of humanity. And I think it's very clear that in invoking the concept of humanity, um, Césaire clearly has Hegel's idea of the concrete universal in mind. Um, in the literature, there's a lot, there's some debate about the extent to which Fanon is following Césaire on this question. For now, I'm just putting this here as a kind of mediating step, right? Why am I justified in bringing this concept of the concrete universal in when Fanon himself doesn't actually directly refer to it? His teacher Césaire does, and insofar as there are lots of similarities between the way that Césaire and Fanon think about um, the role of humanity um, in understanding colonial struggles, I think we can be justified in, in invoking it here. So Césaire says, listen to what Hegel, and this is in, a, in um, a, le a letter to Leopold Senghor, listen to what Hegel says, Leopold, to arrive at the universal one must immerse oneself in the particular. <laughs> and then in a 1997 interview, he says, Hegel explains that we should not oppose the singular to the universal and that the universal is not the negation of the singular, rather it is by enhancing the singular that we reach the universal. We had been told in the West that in order to be universal, we should have started by denying that we are black. On the contrary, I told myself, the more we are black, the more we will be universal. So I think this is a just a helpful way of situating um, how we might begin to bring concrete universality into the discussion. So um, just a few more technical things. And here I'm drawing on uh, Robert Stern's work, who's written a lot on Hegel and the idea of a concrete universal. What makes a concrete universal concrete rather than abstract? They are grasped through their intrinsic and necessary connection with their individual instances. So um, Hegel suggests that in fact, concrete universals are already implicit in universal affirmative statements such as all humans are mortal. And what unites the subject he says is not the quantifier, all, but the universal genus or kind human being. So human being, um, functions as a different kind of universal that remains, at, in, in Hegel's account, intrinsically and necessarily attached to its individual instances in a way that thinking about property universals, um, they're, they're not intrinsically and necessarily connected in the same way. Um, this universal human being is not a property of being, obviously being human is not a property of being human, um, but simply quote, and I'm quoting Robert Stern here, what the individual is, insofar as that individual is an instance of that kind of thing, it is therefore a substance universal and not a property universal. So I want to just quickly, three features then, right? The first feature we just heard from Stern, all, Stern talks about all of these, and I'm actually drawing on him to, to get these three points. So a concrete universal is what the individual is. It's an instantiation of a particular kind of thing. Second, unlike abstract universals, concrete universals support generic statements. Um, so for example, human beings need reciprocal recognition. They also support normative statements um, because this person has renounced, I'm just giving an example of a kind of normative statement we might get in, from reading Fanon, because this person has renounced his freedom and retreated into bad faith, he is failing his duty as a human being and is a bad instance of its kind. So um, I'll just flag here that um, in thinking about concrete universals um, and saying that they support generic statements and normative statements, um, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to Michael Thompson's work in thinking about how life form concepts function differently than other kinds of, of concepts that we might employ. And so I think the idea of a concrete universal, when Stern says that they support normative state, generic and normative statements, I think we can also sort of make that connection here and why the concept of the human as a universal is distinctive. Um, it's different from saying that, right, all human beings have dignity and, and so on and so forth. The third point, and this is a point I think that's really important, it's the point that I think, sorry to keep, you sent me the paper, Carol, so I'm, um, that Carol, it's, it's, the, it's the point of difference, um, that concrete universals can be exemplified in individuals with vastly different properties. So when we're talking about concrete universalities, we're not talking about what people share in common, right? That we're not trying to identify the common and essential properties that everyone must have in order to count as a member of this kind. 
Concrete universality requires this differentiation and difference. Um, it requires that it's exemplified in individuals with vastly different properties, difference at the level of particular modes of being, such that individuals need not share additional properties in order to exemplify the same concrete universal. I think this is really important. Um, it avoids us getting back into sort of essentialist traps about trying to, um, it, again, taking the class, you know, all humans are rational. Well, what, hap what, what, what happens with the exceptions? And I think the whole idea of concrete universality is trying to move us away of thinking about universality in those terms. Um, Okay, so just to quickly, I'm going to quickly bring us back. Did we start at like 635, 640? Okay, um, so just to bring us back to the passages that are most important in Fanon's um, reading of Hegel on recognition. Um, the, the way to sort of bring, because we got into a lot of technical stuff about what a concrete universal is. The reason I think this is really important is that for Hegel and for Fanon as well, the concrete universal and its connection with, with genus or species concepts, with the concept of the human, plays a crucial role in Fanon's reading of Hegel's account of recognition. Um, in, de, in, in, in Hegel, in developing his account of self-consciousness and the universal shape of spirit or geist, Hegel argues that it is, he says, the consciousness of the concrete universal of the species that constitutes self-consciousness or the pure eye. So I just want to add a piece. So bringing the, the idea of the concrete universal into the story of recognition. It's clear that this idea that he, we are being human or being an individual self-consciousness requires recognition. That's one piece of the story. The second piece of the story that's important for Hegel and that I think Fanon is bringing in in a very different and oblique way is that recognition also requires something to some something about recognition of our concrete universal and in Hegel's case he calls this self in his sort of technical term he says self consciousness is the gatung um, it's translated as genus but maybe species is more appropriate here that is for itself so self consciousness doesn't just require recognition from the other. What happens in this relation of mutual recognition is that I become aware of myself as a member of a particular species or, or, or gatung, as he calls it, um, and that we mutually um, come to constitute what it is to be a member of this concrete universal, um, what it is to participate in something like a mutually recognitive um, articulation of species life. So. I just wanted to bring that idea back into those passages that are the most important for Fanon in thinking about recognition. Um, and so the, the added piece there is that it's not just, okay, recognition is a condition of possibility for being human. Fanon affirms this idea of reciprocity. When Fanon says that that recognition has to be human, I think he's bringing in this further piece from Hegel in, in, in the text where Hegel also says that self-consciousness doesn't just require recognition from another self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is also an awareness of myself as an individual I that is also at the same time a member of a more universal species. So this is um, just to wrap up, um, I guess what I wanna say in terms of how um, recognition and the human and the concrete universal come together. Okay, so the last section here. Um, what I want to do now, so in the longer quote, I'm going to throw us back to this original passage. In, in, I started just with that first part, right? I find myself suddenly in the world and I recognize for myself one right alone, that of demanding human behavior from the other. Um, the next, in the next line, he says, one duty alone, that of not renouncing my freedom through my choices. And this clearly brings, if the first piece is sort of very, you know, Hegel, Hegelian, German, he's German idealist, um, it might also be Fichtean because he actually uses Fichtean language by the end, right, the very end, right? So we'll just say it's, if the first piece is Fichtean Hegelian, the second piece is sort of very existentialist. Um, it also br explicitly brings in this idea of freedom. And so um, what I want to do now is to bring some existentialist theses to bear on the idea of the concrete universal, um, to avoid right this idea of a concretely universal normative conception of humanity. I think 
clearly needs to avoid an ahistorical essentialism about human nature. Um, I don't think Hegel falls prey to this either, but in talking about concrete universals, I do think we have to be careful all, careful to make sure that um, we don't fall back into um, a historicism or essentialism. Um, and this is especially important in Fanon's case, given certain core existentialist com commitments. So clearly, just to go back to, he, he clearly says that the human world, the human relations of recognition, these are all a result of creative acts of self-transcendence, the results of, uh, quote, actional beings engaged in struggle. So I think we can also add a further, more mundane sense of concreteness in the idea of the concrete universal. Um, the concrete universal is concrete because it is the material result of human activity and human praxis. It's produced through human relations, practices, and institutions. Um, what I wanna do now is to bring in two features of existential humanism um, that we can incorporate into the account of the concrete universal. One is this idea of self-transcendence, and the second is this idea of, um, and I'm, I'm drawing this uh, from, from Sartre to, to get the, to this idea, the idea that our acts of self-transcendence acts of self -transcendence, um, are subject to certain a priori limitations, Sartre says, that make up the universal human condition. So the first, um, this first piece of self-transcendence um, just, I, if we recall, so what we're trying to bring in is the importance of human practice, of human self-creation, this idea that we are actional beings. If we recall the three features of the concrete universal that I mentioned above, um, so it's not a property, um, it supports generic and normative statements, it's exemplified in individuals that need not share other properties. We can add a fourth point um, that I think would be a part of Fanon's understanding of the concrete universal. He says, uh, so I, we would add, in the case of human beings whose activity and values are self-consciously realized, humanity as a concrete universal is the historical and material result of human praxis as self-transcendence. So the idea of self-transcendence here, I'm getting from um, Sartre. Uh, I'm having, I can't see this whole quote because I'm, it's covered by the Zoom. Um, This part? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so I won't read the whole passage, but here Sartre was saying sort of very characteristically, um, characteristically existential sense um, that Fanon is clearly adopting, that man is always outside of himself. We are projecting and losing himself. It is in losing himself beyond himself that we are realized. Um, he identifies being man or being human with this transcendence. Um, and he says that this is one way of understanding what we might mean by existentialist humanism. It's a humanism. So this is important because the human, the clearly the invocation of the human, um, we could say can also be understood in light of existential human, existentialist humanism. This is a humanism because we remind man that there is no legislator other than himself and that he must in his abandoned state, um, when I find myself suddenly in the world, as Fanon says, make his own choices. And also because we show that it is not only by turning inward, but by constantly seeking a goal outside himself in the form of liberation or some special achievement that man will realize himself as truly human. Um, so this is um, this aspect of self-transcendence that being human is something that we need to create. In the next passage, um, Sartre speaks explicitly of the construction of human universality. Um, he says the human universality exists, but it's not a given. It's in perpetual construction. In choosing myself, I construct universality. I construct it by understanding every other man's project, regardless of the era in which he lives. So just bringing in these ideas of self-transcendence to the concept of the concrete universal, I think is, um, important to, to mitigate against some worries that we might fall back in, especially when we're talking about, you know, substance and kinds, that we're gonna fall back into a kind of essentialism. I'm gonna skip some of this. Um, here are some, these are some passages where I pulled from Fanon, where I think he taught basically um, subscribes to this idea of self-transcendence and the construction of human universality. Um, 
one of the things that he says um, in, I'm just looking at the second quote here, he says that we need to create the ideal conditions of existence for a human world. And so I just wanted to, again, bring in these existential elements to avoid um, uh, an ahistorical or essentialist conception um, of concrete universality. So I'm going to, for the sake of time, because I want to stop very soon. The second piece is this idea of a priori um, limitations, which provide, you could say, something like the a universal human condition under which we act. Um, existentialism emphasizes repeatedly that there is no universal unchanging human nature or essence, but of course, possibilities for human transcend self transcendence are not unconstrained. Um, and powers of action and self transcendence are subject to what Sartre calls a priori limitations. And he also refers to this in terms of a universal human condition. Um, <clears throat> again, not reading that long quote. What I want to say is that when Fadon says that we have one human right to demand human behavior, to I recognize one human right that we have to demand human behavior from the other, that I have a duty to not re renounce my freedom. We can understand these as sort of the constraints under which we act. Um, the constraints under which we are to realize something like a universal human condition, um, the, condition the, the constraints under which we are to, as he says in that previous passage, create the ideal conditions of human existence. And I was just bringing this additional aspect that we get from Sartre's way of articulating existential humanism into Fanon's account. Um, I'm saying this very quickly because I really want to um, wrap up here. Um, and... This, I think, just to go, this was my way of trying to understand um, the quote that I started the talk with, the quote that basically I had in my mind throughout uh, trying to understand what Fanon might, um, what Fanon might mean by um, saying that we have one human right to demand um, human behavior from the other. Um, and I think I will stop there um, and I'm looking forward to come to our discussion. Hi, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, I was I was just wondering about the relationship between the one right and and the one duty. Um, and I'm assuming uh, so. I don't know the co the correlativity thesis of 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 rights and duties. So if I have a right, there's a corresponding duty that some duty holder has to to respect it. And so if Fanon endorses that, then either the duty he holds corresponds to other people's having that right, or he's the only person who has that right. Um, so I, I, I don't know. It, it's not meant to be a challenge, but an invitation to say more about the relationship between the one right and, and the one duty. I think that's a great question. Um... In another context, someone also asked me about, because he phrases it in terms of a right and a duty, one thought would be that maybe he does have in mind that, that, it, that yeah, where there's a right, there also has to be a duty. Rather than saying that he is the only one, what were you saying that one way of reading it is that he is the only one with the right and the duty? Yeah, if, if others have that right, um, the right, the right to be treated uh, as a human, um, then that gives him duties to treat them that way. Yep. So that's either part of the one duty or there's a, there's a second duty. Got it. So I think that's right. There's at least two duties because there is a duty already entailed in the reciprocity of recognition. And then this further duty, we could call it an existentialist duty, <laughs> um, a, a duty to affirm something of an existentialist conception of freedom seems to not, so it's not a deduction. So he's not, he's not Fichte. <laughs> um, I don't think it's, it, it's a good question in terms of what the relationship between those two things are. In the talk, I clearly thought of, I didn't, you're, you're right. I thought less about the conceptual connection between the two claims. And I tried to give the sort of like, Right, one piece of it is clearly a Hegelian recognition type claim, and the other piece of it is an existentialist, existentialist humanist type claim about freedom. Um, the question of whether or not they are 
act that this right and this duty are entailed by another, I think is a good question. Arguably, the conception there is a conception of freedom that is entailed by recognition in the German philosophical tradition. I think that conception of freedom is different from this one. So that is a very good question. That might be, um, I don't think it's an objection against me, but it might be an objection that we could raise to pose to Fanon, whether or not this concept of freedom is the best one to, and the duty to, to enact this conception of free, this existential conception of freedom is the right one to go with the concept of recognition. So that's a very, that's a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Oh, was I? Okay. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, well, the first is just sort of putting forward a proposal to see what you think of it. Um, and the second one is a really big question that's basically asking you to give me Fanon's answer to the debate between post-structuralists and phenomenologists, but feel free to punt on that one if you want to. Um, so the, the, it, the proposal is, in thinking about concrete universality, I wonder if, I mean, it's a very complicated concept. One thing it reminded me of is uh, something that you see in Wittgenstein, where he talks about family resemblances, he describes it at one point as a complicated network, crisscrossing network of similarities, where this is very open-ended. Um, so like a game in the form of poker doesn't seem to have anything in terms of like properties or a genus in common with peekaboo, for instance, but we call them both games. And, and this concept's open-ended in the sense that we can project the, the term in different ways, in different contexts. Uh, so I was wondering if that might be something worth bringing into the conversation here. I, I can wait for the second question if you want to respond to that. Did you have a second question? Oh yeah, I was going to wait if you wanted to respond. The second one was, um, what does Fanon think about phenomenology? Like it, when you, the only point where you mentioned phenomenology in the talk was in relation to this idea of these uh, concepts of subject that are just like obfuscated ideologies, obfuscated and obfuscating ideologies of the subject. Um, but does Fanon think that there's a way of doing like deep phenomenological analysis of subjectivity, like what Sartre does in Being in Nothingness, that aren't ideologically informed or obfuscating? Uh, so I was just wondering about that. That is a very big question. Yeah. So I didn't say anything about phenomenology. The short answer is that I think his, I did allude. So there's a way in which there's, there's a way in which there are, there's another way of thinking about how his account um, elaborates on a concrete notion of universality. And it's on this, it's his, as he says, it's his focus on experience, um, but it's more, it's not just experience, it's also psychology. So that is the, that's the level of the particular that allows him to articulate to something, to, to something like a more general account of how we might overcome the ideological understandings of what it is to be human and attain, you know, to something like the new or new humanity. Um, so that's another way in which he, um, methodologically, you could say, I don't know if I just want to, it is clearly um, influenced by phenomenology. Most of the literature, I don't, I don't talk about this at all. Most of the literature um, focuses on Fanon and Merleau-Ponty um, and the way that he talks about, you know, the body and the body schema. So clearly there's a phenomenological approach there. It's also a psychological one. And that's another way in which he's trying to articulate the universal through the particular, through the particular experiences um, of, of um, the, the, the subject, the, the psychological subjects that he talks about, um, the examples that he draws on from novels and so on and so forth. Um, the Wittgenstein point is super helpful. I maybe the thing I I want to I, I like about what you I'll highlight two things in what you said. I like your example of peekaboo and and poker that they need not share anything re, like what could we identify really that they share in common but we can identify them as games. I think that's a very helpful example of exactly the point here where <clears throat> why we can speak of a concrete universal of the human 
without going into this question of trying to say, okay, but what do these people actually have in common? Um, or what properties do they actually share in common? So that's a great example. That it's open-ended, I think, is very important. Um, in in the, the Satra passage, he clearly talks about the construction of universal humanity. Um, it's also clear that Fanon, in, when he, Fanon says the new, a new humanity, he clearly, it's projective. It's not, it is something that's open-ended. It's something that has to be created through struggle, uh, through political struggle, through psychological struggle. Um, so I, I think I agree with you about the open-endedness. Without getting too much into Wittgenstein, I'll say one more thing about the comp a, a complication. I think there's a way in which this concrete universal of humanity and the way that he talks about how I have a right to demand human behavior from the other, that it's both presupposed and projected. Um, that's an odd, I didn't account for that in, in the talk. I think I'm interested in thinking about this question of how it can be that for certain um, thinkers in this tradition, I'm in, in the German tradition I'm interested in working with, but also for Fanon and some, um, for people who think that it's that it might still be useful to invoke the human <laughs> um, for thinking about liberatory or emancipatory struggles, um, thinking about the relationship between what concept we're presupposing. Um, usually, why do we have to? Because when we say that something is dehumanizing, which Fanon repeatedly does, we're presupposing something about what it is to be human. And yet it's very important that that notion of the human is in constant process of being constructed. So that's something I didn't account for in my account, but in I would like to in a fuller. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Really interesting. I'm very sympathetic of the of the move of, of taking serious this this notion of humanity and then drawing uh, on Fanon uh, on that. And I too one one suggestion, which is probably also a question, and then another question. Uh, one concerns the uh, the essentialism uh, question. I think uh, the there's a particular form of uh, ideological essentialism that the existentialists uh, rightly criticize, and we should be very wary of that. And the, the typical form of that is saying that uh, the essential features of humanity or being human include uh, being white, male, um, uh, a Christian, a European, etc. That is positing particular features or particular way of being human as the human essence, or that is the immanent ideal of being human. That's always something we should be critical of. Uh, 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 but then there's the existentialist notion, Sartre and others, who are saying that, well, there's something but, uh, specific uh, and defining of being human, and that is the capacity to negativity or negation or, or transcendence or existentialist freedom. Now, uh, that seems to be, be obviously, obviously an essentialist claim, and it is an essentialist claim in the kind of normative or evaluative very broadly, roughly Aristotelian sense, in which uh, to be more free is uh, a bet is better in the sense uh, of better and specific to human beings. Now there is a problematic implication of this that that uh, way that form of essentialism necessarily implies the possibility of being more or less human, and I think that's what we are always worried and should be worried. But it does not seem to me that then just saying that we are not essentials at all helps here. I think we need to think of the difficult implications uh, that this sort of essentials that also the existence subscribes to uh, um, implies. Uh, so uh, basically, I guess my question there would be that, would you agree that, well, this is another form of essentialism? And maybe it comes with problems of its own, which we need to uh, think through rather than just deny any essentials. Because I think when we're denying the essentials, we're denying the first form of essentialism. That they are rightly doing. But then I have another question, which is that, if it's the case, uh, which uh, I understood from your talk, that uh, is the case that uh, Fanon suggests that, uh, is suggesting at least, yeah. implying that uh, being treated uh, humanely or being treated as a human somehow supports uh, what is distinctive of us as humans, which in your reading is existential, existential freedom. Uh, 
Can we say more about what it is to treat someone as a human if it's the case that that treatment supports one's specific human capacity of existential freedom? Thanks. Um, okay. So I, I I don't know if I heard all of the, 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 the sound in here is a little choppy, but I think I, uh, the, the first part, I think I heard you ask whether or not the so there's the existentialist critique of a certain kind of essentialism but in subscribing you were then you mentioned the psychoanalytic account where negativity is essential but you could even say okay for the existentialists self-transcendence is essential and isn't that um bringing essentialism back is, is am i understanding you right it, it's just another right it's just another way of thinking yeah, it's another um, other and a better so form of it so the first thing I would say to that is that going back to it's it's not a property. So it's still and that's what would per, at least begin to per, I don't think it answers the whole question, but it begins to prevent us from falling back into that trap of checking to see if you have this property, then you count as human, um, because I don't think whatever the exist and again i don't know how committed i am to defend i i brought in the existentialist conception because i think it's important for understanding fanon i don't know if in you know putting my own hat on i would independently defend an existentialist conception of freedom per se but i still think that it is not it's wrong to think of it as a property um even if we can think of it as generalizable or or a um, something that can be realized or actualized um, through certain kinds of actions. It's not a property that we can count or check, uh, it, right? It's, it's, it's something that has to be realized. Um, and yeah, so maybe I'll just uh, leave leave it at that for for that question. What is it to treat someone? So what counts as human behavior? So I would say there's two things. <laughs> Fanon does not. Um, so I think what we get are like in Hegel, as you know, <laughs> um, in 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 the master right in in the chapter four of the phenomenology. Hegel doesn't tell us what uh, what freedom looks like. He tells us what domination and subjugation looks like. So you one could argue that Fanon is doing something similar. He doesn't tell us what perfect mutual recognition would look like, but he gives us lots of experiential, psychological, uh, concrete political accounts of what dehumanization looks like. Um, and then I would say more, more positively, um, in the longer version of the talk, I tried to pull out sort of three, uh, three specific, and, and here I, I did, I was thinking, I did have Hegel's philosophy of right in mind, but I didn't, I, I, I cut this out from the talk. I think Fanon does say that there are three, there are three kinds of conditions that we need to think about developing in terms of um, providing the conditions of possibility such that this form of human mutual recognition is possible. One sphere that he's interested in concerns intimate relations. And I think that's when he talks about uh, in, in in black skin white masks, most of the text is about these intimate relations um, and their their pathological forms between um, white women and black men and black men and white women. So he's interested in thinking about establishing what would it mean to think about mutual recognition in the intimate domain. Um, in the second sphere, it would be thinking about forms of in in the wretched of the earth, he thinks about well. In the aftermath of of, of de, even if decolonization is successful, we have to find forms of work that are not simply just more exploitation. That is not simply um, beholden to forms of European capital. So that's another concrete way. And again, we could cash this out, cash this out in Hegelian terms because it's sort of right. We need the intimate sphere. We need the sphere of roughly right work in civil society. And then, of course, in his writings on nationalism and forms of national culture, there, too, I think he's suggesting that here are some concrete ways uh, right, of thinking about what conditions need to be in place. Um, people need to be able to form concrete national cultures in order for 
the possibilities of mutual recognition, right? The possibilities of treating each other in a hum humane way. So I didn't get into this in the talk, but I do think that there are places that we can point to in Fanon, both negatively, where he focuses on what um, mutual recognition does not look like, and then rather than telling us what mutual recognition looks like, he does tell us, well, here are conditions for in, in different spheres of conditions of possibility for establishing something like relations of mutual recognition. I would ask, my, my general question is, what role, if any, does the concept of humanity have in Hegel himself? And can we say that the concept, to the extent that it does play an important role, is a concrete universal for Hegel, or could it actually be an abstract universal? way he uses it. That's a great question. Um, so it's clear that, so I said that Fanon sort of humanizes Hegel's account, um, but it's clear that the, 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 the concept of Geist refers to humanity. And that's clear in, it's not as clear, it's clear in the anthropology. Um, so it, de depending on which part of Hegel you're looking at, it's he's more or less explicit. And there's he's, a, he's speaking at different levels of abstraction, you could say. And certainly in the philosophy of spirit, the spirit in question is humanity. Um, the reason I'm hesitating is because I don't think I want, and I drew on right really abstract stuff in a sense because that stuff might be easier to defend in Hegel. I think if we, because I, I didn't talk about Hegel's anthropology, I didn't talk about Hegel's philosophy of history. And I think if we want to think about Hegel's concept of humanity, that's probably where we would need to look. And then there I would say that he probably does not even though he gives us helpful conceptual tools for theorizing a notion of concrete universality that would not fall prey to, to some of these other concerns that we have when we appeal to universal humanity. It's not clear that he himself is so great on this point. <laughs> um, I think, well, I could, so I, I started the talk by mentioning that um, Daniel James and Franz Snopic were, were working on, so they they actually just finished a book and I think they're, so I'll just help talk to them. Their book is going to, I think, be a lot more judicious and careful and critical in terms of thinking about how Hegel <laughs> treats the concept of humanity, especially in connection with questions of race um, and colonialism. <clears throat> I would say as far, as far as the talk goes and as far as I'm you know thinking about this right now I want to say that the conceptual tools for thinking about concrete universality I think are genuinely helpful I think can help us articulate not just what Fanon is doing but just think about what concrete universal the, the idea of concrete universality could do in thinking about all kinds of questions I don't think I would want to defend Hegel's way of understanding humanity. My, my, I think he clearly would fall prey to some of the contradictions that's been explored even in the, the literature on Kant, where Kant clearly thinks that, you know, all human beings are rational, and yet he's able to make all of these distinctions on the basis of races, and Hegel's going to fall prey to similar criticisms, I think. So I don't want to defend Hegel's understanding of humanity. <laughs> Hello, my name is Hope. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, so I, I really love this. At the beginning, you said something like, you know, we have from Hegel, universality, particularity, singularity, and for things to be going right in the social world, they all need to be one big happy family. And that means we need to understand each one of them in a sort of deeper sense than is initially apparent under conditions of oppression, something like that. But in the story you told subsequently, it seemed like universality got a lot of treatment and so did singularity, but not so much particularity. And in particular, I'm struck by the Cesar quote that says, like, my leaning into blackness, which I am, you know, provisionally positioning as a kind of particularity. I wasn't 100% on the ontology of that. It sounded like you were saying 
um, like humanity would be the universal, that different like ways of being a human being would be the particular, and that like individual people are the singular, but maybe I'm misplacing how that works. So with that schema, I see the sort of Cesar's affirmation as of um, their blackness as an affirmation of a particular kind of particularity. And I'm wondering, and so then also that makes me think of like the Haitian constitution, right? And so like everybody who becomes a citizen is black. That's an affirmation of a particularity, but done in like a more subtle and complex way than, you know, like exclusionary uh, ethno-nationalist policies, because like you can become black as, you know, even if your like skin is white or something like that as part of the constitution. So I'm wondering if you can say something about what kind, how do we need to understand the particularities we have, especially the ones that we are gifted by a history of oppression, like perhaps racial particularity in a way that is compatible with the concrete, universal, and existential, individual, free, free non-oppressive relations? Um, I guess one question, I, I, I'll try to answer your question, but one question I have about this question is why the, the forms of particularity are necessarily not compatible with being with with the universal of being human, especially when it is through those particularities that the concept of the human is constructed. But one thing I will say just on this issue, I think there there's another passage that I didn't quote here where Fanon is talking about basically forms of uh, national national forms of nation building thinking about national forms of na african nationalisms and there are a lot of passages where when he's writing about this he says that this is compatible with universe like if our struggles if our struggles for national liberation are to be true he says they have to be compatible and basically are working towards something like this this, this universe more universal um and cannot be in conflict with um the universal so there's and, and i hate I, I don't want to use this word because it's very loaded and it's I, I don't know that i want to attribute this to fanon but the thought is something like our nationalisms can't be in conflict with a cosmopolitan like something more cosmopolitan something more general and universal so that's why my question my, my thought was the the whole point in in the idea of the concrete universal is to show that there's not some Necessary. There's no necessary conflict between affirming those particular ways of being and at the same time expressing the concrete universal. So, and and I take it that yeah, in in the, all of the writings that I'm aware of where he talks about national liberation, the the idea is always that this is compatible compatible with and in fact is part of the working towards the new humanity. Does, does that help? Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I really appreciated the talk. Um, it was really, uh, I really think it was a, a interesting and fruitful way to frame like a lot of the really contentious conversation happening around Fanon's humanism and the relationship between like a universal and the particularity as it emerges in the like discussion on anti-blackness. Um, I wanted, I think my question could potentially relate because I, I, to the previous one, because I did want to ask about the concrete universal and maybe about recognition theory. So I, I am, I'm okay as well with you holding off like, or critiquing the approach that sort of treats Fanon as like just being really critical of Hegel's recognition all the way down. But I worry that when we rush through that, we miss out on the significance of the Manichaean structure, the ways in which whiteness and blackness are constitutive elements of those conditions that you were talking about for recognition. Because Fanon is a healer, right? He's a he's a therapist. And he what he's doing in Black Skin, White, White Mass is he's thinking about his colonized patients and the ways in which their own self-recognition under colonial and white regimes has become conceptions of like the white perspective on them. So like the, the you could say particular perspective of whiteness has told them that they are inferior and that their specific pathological symptoms are their own fault or like a structure of inferiority. And 
So that that has to do with being immersed in a form of recognition, right? And the question is then like, beyond just the conception of appealing to universal, what would it mean to self-create if your conditions of recognition are run through all the way down with the Manichaean dynamics? And I think like, when we say something like concrete universal, we might go too fast and miss out on that like deep like self-constitution that is both like expressive in his work with his patients and in the theory of like self-constitution, yeah. That's great. Um, so I think everything you said is right. So I don't want to rush. Well, I'll just pose pose one puzzle. I think you're absolutely right about black skin, white masks and how the pathological forms of not just rec relations of recognition, but self-recognition mm -hmm. is sort of the a, a, a question, a thread that runs through, right, mm -hmm. the book. One puzzle is that then, right, we could ask is why the book ends with this account of, um, yeah, human recognition, uh, create, let's create a world, a human world of recognition, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's, that's a puzzle in, in just reading Fanon. I, I don't know how much I have to say about this right now in the psychological context. Mm -hmm. I think in the political context, it becomes more clear how he, it's more clear to me um, how he thinks about this because the Manichaean structure, it, it, it's internalized, but of course it's also real. <laughs> um, that's the colonial, it's the colonizer and the colonized. So the Manichaean structure is there at the political, at the psychological level, as well as the political level. And it's, it's more clear in the political context how he thinks we might overcome that um, uh, right revolutionary struggle, <laughs> um, decolonization. So I think, and and that's a helpful. This is where again the the Hegel passage that he quotes about struggle is so helpful for thinking about um, what it means to overcome the Manichaean structure politically. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think I'm just going to have to think more about this. You know, psychologically, clearly, you're right. He 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 himself was a, he, he was a psych. He's trying to help people <laughs> move through the struggle, but maybe the answer in the psychological case is just it's always going to be much more complicated. It's going to take different different kinds of work. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I'm wondering, and you just touched on this in response to the last answer. But I'm wondering if you could maybe draw out um, some of the implications of this concept for like uh, decolonial praxis. So um, that's a huge question, but one <laughs> thing, but here's the, 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 the reason I think it is important <laughs> for decolonial practice, praxis, um, is that Fanon seems to think that decolonial praxis has to be normatively guided by a concept of universal humanity, and that's what makes it justified. Um, now, maybe that's more, so I don't know if that's, a, you know, that doesn't give us, it's not a strategic, it doesn't help us in like, <laughs> um, yeah, fighting the rev the revolutionary fight that we're going to have to fight in decolonization. So it doesn't help us with strategy, but I think he does, yeah, in order for this form of decolonial praxis to be justified, it has to be normatively guided by this concept of humanity. Um, one thing that I say more clearly in the written version of the paper is that um, all genuinely emancipatory struggles have to have this universalistic um, character um, and that it helps us, well, this I don't talk about in the paper, but I do think that the, the import of the concrete universal and a concept of humanity is to help us identify forms of, revolution, whether it's decolonial or, right, forms of, of, of revolutionary struggle, forms of social struggle, forms of political struggle that are genuinely emancipatory and those ones that may in fact turn out to be regressive. Um, so there's a, what I like about, and I didn't, again, in the written version, I maybe stress this more. 
even in my first when I said he rejects the false universal in a way every right that's everyone Fanon is one of many many people in his own context in our context that we're always arguing against the false conception of humanity that we we take to be deeply problematic and ideological what's unique about him is that he doesn't give up on the idea of universal humanity and its significance in, in a line for decolonial praxis is that I think it gives us the it's the normative underpinning of a decolonial praxis that we would say is genuinely emancipatory. Um, well, I'm very sympathetic, as you can imagine, because I also use the notion of concrete universality very centrally in the original, um, making room for um, the ways that attention to the women question is philosophical because of a, not just the way differences are philosophically relevant. Uh, but also as constructed and so forth. Um, I like your uh, more activist and open-ended reading. I'm just wondering how this, um, and I would just note before I ask my real question uh, that, in, you know, I think that Hegel in a way and Marx even to some degree thought of concrete universality as within a totality, uh, the relations within a totality. And I think that uh, the Fanon version would be an improvement because it um, opens it up more, makes it even more dynamic than it was for those two in, in uh, seeing it as an ever evolving totality rather than stages of historical development, for example. Um, but I guess I would want you to say a little bit more about two things. Is this also this human right to be recognized is it also a demand on all others or just on anyone that one would encounter? And if it's a demand on all others, what? how does it extrapolate to providing each of us providing the conditions that we all need for uh, this, the conditions for uh, flourishing as self-transcending individuals? That's one question. How do you see it as... Um, <clears throat> as as uh, imposing sort of social level human rights and or and or duties because the phraseology in Fanon is still from the standpoint of an individual and that's easier to understand that I can demand it of any particular person I come in contact with but what I'm not sure that Fanon has much to say about this, but anyway, just to pose it as a question to you, what would it extrapolate to? And the other issue is, is recognition enough? Because I think that um, it's important, but it's not the only demand that we're making of others. Aside from a demand for the conditions of our flourishing, we also want care and concern from others, as feminist theorists have pointed out. And so, what would interest me would be an extrapolation of concrete universality that would incorporate not just the second person um, recognition or the <clears throat> or even a third person perspective on it, but what does it imply about care and concern? I'm just posing this for the future. I mean, it's huge questions. If you have any thoughts about it, though, I'd be interested. Um, thanks for that, Carol. So. I think it has to be, a, in principle, it has to be a demand that can be issued, that we issue to all others in principle. Obviously, depending on the context, we're gonna be issuing it to specific others, but I don't see it as being in principle restricted in scope in some way. Um, I mean, this goes back to the first, it's nice because the last question goes back a bit to the first question. Um, I don't, I don't think Fanon, his method is just different. So I don't want, it's, it's not a fault. He's, his project is just different, right? So he employs this language in certain places and I was interested in trying to unpack it as much as I could, but he is not in the same, right? He He's not going, he's not in the same project as some other philosophers, which are actually going to try to articulate something like, okay, what are, what then are the, whether they're human rights or what, what is the system of right? <laughs> what is, right? What, what, what can we actually 
say that this demand amounts to is something for him that's again more it, it I don't want to say it's a failing because he's he's interested in doing something else, right? He he affirms that there is something like this right. And then he's going to be interested in thinking about all of the various failures, both in intimate psychological contexts, but also in um political political contexts, um, in colonial contexts. Um, is recognition enough? Uh it depends on what you mean by rec. So it depends on how narrow or how broad we we want to make the concept of recognition. Recognition in terms strictly in terms of just second personal relations is not going to be enough. It's it, it's essential, but it's not going to be enough. I alluded to in one of my answers and in in the longer version of the paper, I talk more about um, not about care and concern, um, which I think you're right is very important, but about what Fanon might think the concrete conditions um, of flourishing might be, the concrete conditions, not just for flourishing, but that could actually um, produce relations of, of mutual recognition might be. Um, and again, his project is not the same, right, systematic one of Hegel, where he's gonna lay out very clearly for us what those conditions look like. But I do think he gives us a glimpse into, um, what they can't be, and also some minimal claims about um, things that have to be in place in order for these forms of mutual recognition to be possible. I alluded to them. Um, I alluded to some of them because he is interested in thinking about forms of national culture. He's interested in thinking about, well, in the aftermath of decolonization, what does meaningful work look like such that, right, something like relations of recognition could obtain. Um, yeah, but I don't, I, I don't think I want to fault him for not being the systematic philosopher. His, his project was just very different. Yeah, no, it was mostly to you. I was asking as you think more about it, what do you think about those things? Not, not about Fanon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was Thank great. You. Thank you, Carol. To the audience and please feel free to continue afterwards. Thank you, Omar. And thank you very much.